that you know your dead your your loved ones were supposed to die at home and they were supposed to be surrounded by their loved ones and they were supposed to have that opportunity to say whatever needed to be said um, and so it was devastating to these women and fathers and brothers as well that that didn't have that opportunity um, another little story one day i'd given the presentation at the farm and afterwards this little a girl came up to me and she couldn't have been more than about 11. And she said, can I ask you a question? Well, of course you can, sweetheart. She said, if I was one of those ladies and I didn't know where my loved one was buried, would I just go to a cemetery and kind of mourn generally? This was an 11-year-old. And I said, that's exactly what you would do, sweetheart. You would go there with all the other ladies on what they called Memorial or Decoration Day and you would lay flowers on the grave, and you would hope that somebody somewhere was laying flowers on the grave of your loved one. This program is a video presentation of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Please consider making a monetary gift to support our efforts to bring Civil War history to viewers like you. Visit cwrtdc.org to learn how. Our speaker this evening is Janet McCabe. She joins us from Crofton, Maryland. Uh, Janet earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Virginia and a Master's of uh, Business Administration degree from the Amos Tuck School at Dartmouth College. Although she spent her professional career in the financial services industry, she has been fascinated by the American Civil War ever since her father took her to her first battlefield when she was eight years old. Janet currently serves as a docent at the George Spangler Farm and Field Hospital outside of Gettysburg. And her retirement goal is to become a licensed battlefield guide. Her recent article on removing the Confederate dead from Gettysburg was published in the April 2022 issue of Civil War Times magazine. Please join me welcoming Janet McCabe. Okay, well, thank you all very much for giving me this opportunity to tell you this story. It's um, one that I found more fascinating than I anticipated when I started researching it. Normally, when I start this, I ask people, have you ever heard of Rufus Weaver? And more often than not, there's only a couple people in the audience who have ever heard of this gentleman. But he started to get a little more attention um, since this plaque was erected in the town of Gettysburg in 2014. If anybody's had ice cream at Mr. G's Ice Cream Parlor, it's on Baltimore Street down at the foot of Cemetery Hill. It's the best homemade ice cream in town. As you sit um, at the side of that shop and uh, enjoy your ice cream, right across the street is this plaque that talks about the fact that Weaver was the gentleman who was um, hired to remove the Confederates and return them to their home soil in the South. And it also says in here that, that he was never paid for his labors. Well, that's true and it isn't true. Um, and there's a lot to this story as I found when I started to investigate it. So how did I stumble on this story? Well, it's because of being a docent out at the Spangler Farm. We tell this story of, of medical treatment at the time and the fact that the surgeons weren't the butchers that a lot of people try to depict them as. So that's one story we tell. And the other story we tell is that of the Spanglers and the other civilians in Gettysburg and what happened to them when 165,000 soldiers descended on their town of 2,400 and in some cases stayed there for weeks. I talk about the impacts on the Spanglers and the most long lasting evidence of the occupation of their farm was of course, the bodies that remained buried in the orchard. Uh, the, the hospital was there for five weeks. Over the course of that time, approximately 120 men actually died from their wounds while there and they were buried in the orchard. 
roughly, most of them, of course, were Union soldiers and about 20 were Confederates. Almost invariably, when I finish my presentation, somebody comes up and asks, have they gotten all the bodies? Are you sure they're all gone? And the official line of the Gettysburg Foundation who owns the property is, yes, they've all been retrieved. But being an analyst by training, I usually like to make sure that the facts that I'm repeating are, are actually accurate. So I decided to do some digging. I found out that the original lists that Weaver had prepared were held at the Virginia Historical Society. I made an appointment to go down there. And when I got there, the librarian had not only pulled the folder containing Weaver's handwritten lists, but he also had this other folder called Correspondence regarding the reburial of the Gettysburg dead. He said, I thought you might be interested in this too. And I was. So the first thing I did, of course, was to take pictures of all of Weaver's lists. Um, any of you who've done original research know the thrill of holding in your hands a document that was written over 150 years ago. And then I turned to the folder full of correspondence, and there was a lot of stuff in there. There were letters that were dated 1902. And I'm thinking, what in heaven's name was going on in 1902 that, that still related to the Gettysburg dead? So I took photos of all the letters. There were more than 20 of them and uh, transcribed them, because of course all but one were handwritten, uh, organized them chronologically and, and started piecing together this story. Now for a little bit of background, um, I hope that most of you have read this fabulous book by Drew Gilpin Faust. It wasn't until I read it years ago that I realized that national cemeteries were a product of the American Civil War. I just kind of thought they'd been there forever. But in fact, in the wars preceding the American Civil War, the casualties had been so small that they could easily be handled by the soldiers themselves. You know, there might've been 20, 30, 50 guys killed. And so they would either carry them back to their hometowns and bury them there, or they could be buried in the local churchyard. And it wasn't much of a burden to anyone to deal with this. Then came the Battle of First Manassas with its thousands of casualties and nobody was prepared for it, north or south. Um, they had no idea of what, uh, how to handle um, all these corpses. And so the burials were haphazard at best. And especially on the Union side, um, as you know, uh, most of the battles that the Union Army in the East fought in the first couple of years of the war, they ended up abandoning the field, having to retreat back to Washington and their dead were left uh, in the hands of the Confederates. Now, if the Confederates stuck around, they'd usually bury the Union dead as well as the Confederates. But more often than not, they took off in pursuit of the Union Army and those bodies were left behind. And I think you could probably understand that if you were a farmer whose fields had just been devastated by the invading armies, that you might not have a lot of sympathy for those four dead Yankees laying in your pasture. So it was um, a shock to the Union armies in 1864 when they began to advance over those old battlefields and see literally skeletons clad in Union blue lying on top of the soil or scattered bones that had been um, you know, knocked around by animals. So they, they decided that something to be done. There was funding that was uh, authorized by Congress, uh, certain officers were appointed, given the job to uh, hire workers, in most cases, newly freed slaves, uh, retrieve these remains and put them into national cemeteries where from that point forward, the graves would be respected and honored in perpetuity. But there was a, that was for the Union soldiers. Uh, the same courtesy was not extended to the Confederates. There was a big difference between the way the Union were treated and the Confederate dead. As I just mentioned, the Union soldiers were placed in national cemeteries. All the work was financed by the federal government. And it was largely a wartime project being wrapped up by the end of 1866. But for the Confederates, of course, there was no funding from the federal government. They weren't welcome in those national cemeteries. And the job was left to civilians. And by civilians, in most cases, what that means was the ladies 
whose job traditionally was to prepare the dead for burial. Across the South in every sizable town and city, there sprang up organizations called Ladies Memorial Associations. And their primary uh, purpose was to uh, retrieve, rebury, and make sure that the dead, the you know, the um, their dead heroes basically were uh, remembered. A good example of that is the Ladies Memorial Association of Winchester, Virginia. As I'm sure you can imagine, there were an awful lot of skirmishes and battles fought all over the lower Shenandoah Valley. I think literally practically every farmer's field had a grave. Um, so the ladies decided that the first thing they could do would be to gather all those Confederates from across the valley and rebury them in a plot or in a, in a cemetery in the town of Winchester, which became known as Stonewall Cemetery. And ultimately they had over more than 3000 bodies buried there. They, this was financed by public subscription. These ladies literally raised the money, a nickel and a dime at a time. They would have bazaars where they'd sell embroidered handkerchiefs or anything they could think of that people were, would be willing to pay money for. And they'd have, you know, cakewalks and tea dances and all that sort of thing. Um, absolutely no government money was contributed to this. And obviously it the work could not start until after the bullets had stopped flying. So this was something that was done in the South, basically from 1865 till say about 1869. The same thing was done in Fredericksburg, in Raleigh, in any city across the South where there had been hospitals where significant numbers of men had died. Um, but again, all by the ladies of the South. Um, I'm sometimes asked this question, so I'll answer it now. Why weren't the men involved? Well, there always were speeches at these events, and ex-Confederates had to be very careful about what they said in public, lest they be perceived to um, have not accepted the results of the conflict. So it was mostly the ladies that organized the events and, and um, did, this, did some of the speeching, or clergymen as well, but you know, nobody who had previously worn uh, uniform was involved typically. Now, the ladies knew that they had not retrieved all the dead. They knew that there were still um, dead Confederates in Pennsylvania and Maryland, but the South was so devastated by the war that they simply didn't have the money to go up there and pay to have them shipped you know, by steamer or by railroad um, back from that far away. So that sort of waited as a potential dream of theirs until about 1869, when articles started to appear in Northern newspapers talking about how the farmers, as they were preparing their fields, plowing their fields for the spring planting, were plowing up bones. And the ladies decided that something had to be done. So they turned to this guy. That little gnome-like figure in the front right, the guy with the long beard and short stature, this guy named Samuel Weaver, he had been hired by the town fathers of Gettysburg to uh, relocate the Union dead into Gettysburg National Cemetery. And this picture is of him and his crew in Hanover, Pennsylvania, exhuming some bodies that had been buried at the hospital there and preparing them for transfer to Gettysburg. Now, Weaver either was a very compassionate man or he sensed a future business opportunity because he kept uh, notes of Confederate burials where he found them. The ladies heard about this and they got in touch with him in 1870 to start um, the work of bringing the Confederate soldiers home. But unfortunately for the ladies, he was killed in a railroad accident in February of 1871. Um, I will uh, quote the article here because it's gonna to be too hard for you to read it. That basically it says, and I've lost my note. Where do, where do I have it? But basically it says that he was engaged in shifting his, his car to the proper track when a sudden lurch of the shifter threw him off the platform and he fell under the truck. 
which struck him about the left knee and diagonally across his body. I think you can imagine that uh, he did not survive that. He was dead by the time he got to the hotel. But fortunately for the ladies, he had a son. In fact, he had four sons, but the most important one is the guy we're talking about here, and that is Rufus. Rufus was born in 1841 in Gettysburg, and by 1862 had graduated from Pennsylvania College, now known as Gettysburg College. He then went into Philadelphia to study medicine. And he, we think he probably wasn't in Gettysburg at the time of the battle, but I can't uh, know that for sure. Um, but if he, even if he wasn't there, I'm sure he heard from his family about the horrible things that, the horrible situations following the battle. But by 1871, the date that we're talking about, he was a lecturer in anatomy at Hahnemann Medical College in Philadelphia. So can you think of anybody who'd be more qualified than to exhume human remains than a guy who was a professor of anatomy? I think he probably knew what he was doing. So in the summer of 1871, he went to work for the ladies of Charleston, Savannah and Wake County or Raleigh, North Carolina, sending 80, 100 and 137 sets of remains respectfully, respectively, sorry. Um, when they arrived at the depot, typically there was, uh, they were met by uh, veterans in uniform. Uh, the remains were carried to the cemetery. There were speeches, there were flowers, et cetera. And, their sons and husbands were laid to rest. Um, the ladies of these organizations uh, paid uh, Weaver in full, and there was no delay in his getting his payment there. It's really interesting when you look at these lists that Weaver prepared to uh, look at the detail and figure out where these bodies came from. So again, if I were in person, I would say to you guys, or I would ask you guys, if you were looking for dead South Carolinians, where would you look? And I think somebody in the crowd would probably say the Rose Farm, because that of course is the land across which Kershaw's brigade advanced. And so 33 of the South Carolinians were exhumed from uh, the Rose Farm, 21 from the Black Horse Tavern. That was Kershaw's uh, field hospital. Two were from the Crawford Farm, that's right next door to the Black Horse Tavern. Two from the McMillan Farm. Now the McMillan Farm is just south of the seminary along Seminary Ridge. And uh, those who know the battle well probably remember that on the afternoon of July 1st, it was Perrin's South Carolina Brigade that finally succeeded in pushing the Union troops off of Seminary Ridge. So McMillan Farm being right next to that, you know, these two guys were from Perrin's Brigade. There were 12 guys from uh, Camp Letterman, the general hospital that was established east of town after the battle, and 10 from a hospital in Chester, Pennsylvania. Now, with regard to the North Carolinians, uh, a big chunk of them, 27 of them, came from the Jacob Hankey Farm. That was the field hospital for Rhodes' division. Rhodes had five brigades. Three of those brigades were from North Carolina. So this makes perfect sense. Seven, however, came from the George Bushman Farm, which was a 12th Corps Union Hospital. And I had to think about that for a little bit because the 12th Corps, of course, defended Culp's Hill, which was attacked mainly by Allegheny Johnson's division. And Allegheny Johnson did not have any North Carolina brigades. However, late on the night of July 2nd, Junius Daniels Brigade of North Carolinians were brought down to help Johnson in his assault of Culp's Hill. And so these seven guys were from the 45th North Carolina, which was part of Daniels Brigade. Then there were others from all over the place. This is the list of six different um, farms from which bodies were retrieved, but there were more than just those six. And that reflects the fact that North Carolina suffered more casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg than any other state that was represented there. So they were also in practically every division of the Confederate Army. So it's not surprising that they would have been buried everywhere in the vicinity of Gettysburg. Uh, 
And then, of course, there were, you know, a big, a large number of them that came from Camp Letterman. Now, with regard to the Georgians, I don't have a, a detail on the where the bodies came from that simply wasn't in the files, but I have a story. And that story has to do with Lieutenant Colonel David Wynn of the 4th Georgia. He was part of Dole's brigade. They fought on July 1st against the 11th Corps on at near, blah, blah, at or near, talk Janet. Uh, what became known, um, well, what was known at the time of the battle as Blocker's Knoll, because it was on the farm of a man named Blocker. Well, David Wynn was buried there on the field by his servant. And about the time that the Ladies uh, Memorial Association asked Weaver to retrieve the remains, the family of David Wynn in particular got in touch with him, told him where the body was buried and asked him to send it home to them rather than to the cemetery. Well, when they started to assume the remains, it was discovered that Lieutenant Colonel Wynn had a gold dental plate in his mouth. And Farmer Blocker decided that that would be a good way to compensate him for the damage done to his farm during the battle. So he confiscated the dental plate and held it for ransom. He initially demanded $10, which doesn't sound like much, but that was about $220 or more um, in today's money. Weaver managed to negotiate him down to half that much. And there's a letter in the Park Library to a woman um, down in Georgia in, in which he refers to Blocker's meanness and depravity, but assures the ladies that that wasn't typical of the people of Gettysburg. So apparently at this point in time, he had been charged only with retrieving the identified dead. And I guess the logic behind that was, you know, money was scarce and if the ladies were gonna pay to have somebody shipped down from Gettysburg, they wanted to make sure they weren't paying for some unknown Texans or Arkansans or somebody that didn't belong uh, in the cemetery where they were being buried. And we know that because there's a letter uh, written from by Weaver in October of 1871 to a woman in Savannah who, where he expressed the hope that they would soon send for their unknown soldiers as well. These would be unmarked graves that were at a place where it was logical that they would have been Georgians, such as the farm that was a field hospital for a Georgia brigade. You know, it's not perfectly true that everybody buried there would have been from Georgia, but a large number of those guys would have been from that particular state. And then he went on to say, I have sent south all the state lists, and none but you, North Carolina, and South Carolina have done anything. It seems very strange that Virginia, who is so near and whose known list is not so great as yours, does not recall her dead, whose known list is not so great as yours. Well, Virginia had a heck of a lot more soldiers at Gettysburg than Georgia did. But the answer, I think, lies in Pickett's charge. Those men from Pickett's division who were killed right in front of Union lines, um, their comrades never had the opportunity to reach them to bury them, to identify the graves, et cetera. They were just thrown into long trenches in front of Union lines, buried by Union soldiers. And so with no markers ever having been placed on the graves, it's no wonder that they all ended up being unknown. I've got a, a side story here that I can tell. Um, I was talk, telling this story to uh, a group up at the Spangler Farm and two ladies came up to me afterwards and they said, yeah, that's what happened to our ancestors. One of their ancestors was a surgeon for in Pickett's division, and he was uh, operating at the Curran Farm, which is just south of National Park Service property along the Emmitsburg Road. Um, his son, his 19-year-old son, was shot in the head during Pickett's charge and brought to that hospital. Now, you know there is no way that that father did not mark his son's grave before they left for Virginia. I can't imagine that he didn't. Yet when Weaver went to retrieve the bodies from the Kern farm, there were no markings. And so all he could send south was one box, which as he stated, contained six sets 
sovereign names. So that letter was written in October of 1871 by Weaver. And sure enough, the next month in November, he heard from Virginia. Specifically, he had heard from a lady named uh, Elizabeth Brown, who was the secretary of the Hollywood Memorial Association. Hollywood being the largest cemetery in Richmond. Um, there were a lot of hospitals located in Richmond, of course. There were a lot of battles that took place around Richmond. And so a huge number of, of soldiers needed to be buried. Hollywood Cemetery, which had just been established, mushroomed in size. And the ladies wanted to bring the Gettysburg dead home. So Mrs. Brown and a guy named Charles Dimmick visited Gettysburg that winter. Um, again, this is a question I normally ask the audience, has anybody ever heard of Charles Dimmock? And sometimes somebody raises their hand and says, does that have anything to do with the Dimmock line around Petersburg? Yes, Charles Dimmock was an engineer in the, civil, in the Confederate Army, and he was responsible for laying out the fortifications that defended the city of Petersburg. He also became the city engineer in Richmond after the war and submitted a design for a competition that the ladies were ha having to design a monument to be the centerpiece of the soldiers section in Hollywood. That monument that you see here, which very much resembles a cairn, was designed by Dimmock. He won the, the competition and it's there today. I forget how tall it is, but it's something like 48 feet tall. It's quite impressive. So um, they visited, they negotiated with Weaver, and um, apparently there was some discussion about how they were going to finance this because um, Weaver apparently suggested that perhaps the ladies could go to the Pennsylvania legislature and ask for help. But Dimmick wrote back to say, our ladies could not ask the aid that you propose. While they would not put aside such voluntary assistance as your legislature might offer, they cannot consent to invoke it. In other words, the proud ladies of Richmond weren't about to bend their knees to any Yankee legislature. Thank you. However, Dimmock went on to say that they feel assured that in an economical way, they can meet all the expenses incident to the removal of the bodies. So in April of 1872, some funds were forwarded to this lady, Mrs. Ada Edgerton of Baltimore, who would act as the liaison between the, the ladies of Richmond and Rufus Weaver for years to come. We don't know a lot about Ada Edgerton, except that she came from a family of Southern sympathizers. Her husband had been born in Virginia. Her brother-in-law spent some time in Fort McHenry in the early years of the war for anti-union activities. And she was very active in providing aid to prisoners in uh, Fort McHenry, but also to later to prisoners down in Point Lookout. So when the Great Southern Relief Fair was held in Baltimore in 1866, she was appointed uh, one of the members of the committee that was responsible for delivering the funds that had been designated for Virginia. So I think that explains how she knew the ladies of the HMA, but it didn't explain how she knew Rufus Weaver until I found uh, her obituary in 1906. And in that obituary, it says that she had run a boarding house in uh, Baltimore where, quote, nearly every distinguished man who came to Baltimore to lecture at the Hopkins stayed. So I'm willing to bet that at some point, or more than once, Rufus Weaver, being a doctor, came down to consult with his colleagues at the Hopkins and probably stayed at Ada's um, boarding house. And that's how she knew him, and that's how she became the uh, liaison between the groups. So he got right to work in the spring of 1872. And this is what he accomplished. Uh, in the first year alone, he sent three shipments totaling 2,273 bodies. As I said, at some point, the charge was expanded to not just Virginians, but to all Confederates, those who had not already been shipped south. 
it's an amazing number. And one wonders how could he possibly do it when you consider that he could do it only when the school was not in session because it was still a lecturer at Hahnemann. He did have a team of laborers. We don't know how many, uh, but we do know that he worked from dawn till dusk because he wrote a letter to the ladies later on. And this is what he wrote. My custom was by and very often before daybreak to start out on the field with my men. I not only supervised the general work on the field, but personally did the most important part myself, viz, picking up the bones. For in the absence of boxes, it required one with anatomical knowledge to gather all the bones so that none might be left or lost. I would not reach home with precious freight until dark. And after supper, I would arrange and label every remain or lot of remains. And then by the time I'd written out the record, it would be midnight and after thus generally being engaged from 18 to 20 out of the 24 hours. Now that was a dedicated guy. This is a copy of the cover page for the first shipment. This is Weaver's handwriting. There were a total of 708 sets of remains that were sent in 279 boxes. You can see that down at the bottom. The 239 of those boxes contained individual identified remains. But the other 40 boxes contained um, the remains of soldiers uh, who, were, who could not be identified. But according to what he wrote in here, they belonged to General Pickett's command and were buried on Mr. Nicholas Cadori's land. Also those who were buried at the Second Corps Federal Hospital for Schwartz's. Now, again, that makes sense because it was the second corps that, of course, defended Cemetery Ridge against Pickett's attack. So those guys who didn't die immediately and were carried back to the second corps hospital um, died. If they died there, they were buried at Schwartz's farm. He also collected those who were at Rhodes's Division Hospital, uh, now known as David Shriver's, those at Moses McLean's farm, now owned by a guy named Wills, and those at Emanuel Pitzer's farm. Now, Pitzer's farm was located behind Confederate lines um, west of West Confederate Avenue. So that's a total of 469 bodies in 40 boxes. That's in this shipment, about a third of the bodies were actually identified. But when you look at all sixes, all six of the shipments, a total of only 11 percent of the sets of names were actually, actually able to identify. They were almost all unknowns. Okay, this is the cover page for the third shipment, also made in 1872. These guys were almost entirely unknown. The remains from Camp Letterman and the field hospitals having been removed long since. And you see a lot of uh, farm names on here that you've probably never seen before. Farms like Fissel, Heinzelman, Monfort, Mini, etc. There were um, 683 sets of remains in this shipment, of which only 30 could be identified. And even with those, uh, there was some confusion uh, because, for example, in, in one box, box L held 12 sets of remains. His note says, Three of these 12 were named Lee, Farmer, and Hanley, all of Mississippi. So apparently there were some grave markers that at one point in time had been upright at a specific grave among those 12 graves that were in a row, but they'd been knocked down and lost. And he couldn't really say that of those 12 bodies, which man in particular was named Lee or Farmer or Hanley. But I'm, I imagine that they came from the field hospital for Barksdale's brigade. And that's how we knew they were all from Mississippi. This is more detail from the shipment, of the, from the very first shipment. And this is detail on the guys that were identified. Remember there was a more substantial number of them, 279 of them in that shipment. And it's just amazing the amount of detail that he went into. For example, Lieutenant Morris of Walker's Battery was buried in the northeast corner of Mr. Whistler's, now Lotz's, barn and under an apple tree. Lieutenant A. Trahan was buried about 10 miles northwest of Gettysburg under chestnut tree on Mr. Isaac Reif's farm. 
Corporal McLaurin was buried under a walnut tree at the bend of the road on Mr. Crawford's farm, three and a half miles from Gettysburg on Marsh Creek. And Lieutenant Bradley was buried at the corner of Mr. John Trossel's field on the south bank of Rock Creek, four miles south of Gettysburg. So why did he do this? It's not like he was preparing a list for somebody else to come and get the remains. He was taking the remains. So there really was no need for this amount of detail. Um, it may be that being a scientist, he was also kind of anal and just like detail. Or it could be that he was compassionate and maybe was thinking of the soldier who someday might write to him and say, hey, you know, I buried my brother up there at Gettysburg. I'm not exactly, I can't remember. I didn't know the name of the farm where I buried him. His name was, you know, McLaurin. Do you have any idea what happened to his remains? And he could refer to the list and say, oh yeah, he went to Hollywood. He was in this shipment. Maybe Hollywood can tell you exactly where that box was buried. It's, it's a mystery. Okay, so this is the bill that he prepared uh, for the ladies at the end of the first year. He was being paid $3.25 per body roughly $75, $80 in today's money. And he billed a total of 7,385 bucks, of which he received only 2,800 by the end of the summer. So that left a pretty substantial balance owed. So you might wonder, well, why did he keep working? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, Charles Dimmick assured him that the ladies had $4,000 in hand. The other ladies' memorial associations had paid him, no problem. And as he said in one of his letters, the constant farming over the graves, the remains were generally yielding to decay or absorption, and hence the work had to be done then or never. So he went on. And in the summer of 1873, he sent three more shipments. He received one payment of $380 in the spring. So leaving again, a, a very substantial balance owed to him uh, rule of thumb, if you multiply that by you know 30 or 33, um, you end up with the amount owed. So we're talking about a number between 180 and $200,000 in today's money. Uh, and unfortunately for Weaver, that was the last payment that he would receive for quite some time because of this, the Panic of 1873. This was a widespread economic panic caused by over-speculation in railroad stocks principally. Banks were closing all over the country, and that included Mari and Co., the bank in Richmond in which the ladies had deposited their funds. Um, they, the bank was closed, of course, in the hands of um, receivers. But um, Dimmick writes to Weaver and says, don't worry, you know, there's collateral. And you just have to wait till these things get settled, but you'll get paid eventually. Well, that's the last we know. That's the last letter in the file until 1879, six years later. When Ada Edgerton writes a letter to Mrs. Brown saying, hey, I haven't heard anything. I've written to you several times and you haven't gotten back to me. What's the deal on getting payment for Dr. Weaver? Well, in the meantime, the Hollywood Memorial Association and a lot of the ladies' memorial associations have basically ceased to exist. They had accomplished their goal of making sure that their brave heroes had been buried honorably in places where their remains would be respected. There, you know, they also were involved in erecting some statues. The HMA was involved in putting up the statue of General Lee on the State House grounds in, in Richmond. And so um, a lot of the ladies, including Mrs. Brown, had died or moved on, and the HMA um, just basically went away for a while. So there's a gap in the record until 1889, at which point Weaver writes to Ada Edgerton and says this, over 16 years have now passed away, and today over $12,000 is due me without a word from any of those interested in it a debt in which you, which you have often truly said is one of sacred honor. Every now and then I read in the papers of work going on and raising money for the erection of monuments, and yet there remains this unpaid debt. 
So Ada Edgerton goes to Richmond and basically calls on anybody she knows, including um, uh, Vimic, uh, Robert Stiles, who's a former Confederate artilleryman who was involved with the um, with Hollywood Cemetery, Hunter McGuire, Dr. Hunter McGuire, you've probably heard of, and basically anybody she thought that might have some influence. The HMA had been reestablished, but with all new members. And so when their new secretary, a lady named Kate Pleasance Minor, found out about this, she referred to it as thunder from a clear sky, something totally unexpected. So there followed two years of um, in investigation and quite frankly, I think some dithering on the part of the ladies. There's all kinds of little notes in the folder. Um, you know, uh, well, I, I contacted Mrs. Crenshaw and she vaguely remembers something about this. I talked to, Ms., talked to Mrs. Livingston and she said, yeah, didn't Weaver have a son? Uh, you know, there was lots of vague recollections, but nothing definite about what, you know, the involvement was and what the debt might be. That was owed to Weaver. So finally, two years later, the ladies decide they're going to turn this over to their all-male advisory board and ask what should be done. So the advisory board invited Weaver to come to Richmond and present his case, which he was happy to do, and he convinced them. He won. The board said we, they were fully persuaded that Dr. Weaver's claim has a strong moral obligation upon the association. And I've enclosed the picture of this letter because it's the only one in the file that's typewritten from 1892. But the board suggests that the ladies should sign over to Weaver any proceeds that they might get from the Mari and Co. bankruptcy, which they agreed to do. But the estimate that they had received of that was far short of the amount of money that Weaver claimed he was owed. So they went back to Weaver. This was their solution to the problem. They said to him, you know, we didn't know anything about this debt until very recently. And it's kind of unfair of you to charge us interest on a debt that we didn't know existed. Um, if we'd known about it five years ago, maybe we could have paid it then. And then you wouldn't have incurred this interest. Now, one thing, I don't know whether he actually incurred this interest expense if he had borrowed the money to finance his operations or whether this was just a calculation of what he might have earned had he had the money in hand. But at any rate, Weaver very graciously says to the ladies, okay, I, I won't charge you the $6,000. So that takes the debt back to the original 6,356. They received an estimate from some accountants saying that they could expect to get about $3,800 from the Mari estate eventually. And that left roughly $3,000 to be, to be funded somehow. So they came up with the idea that they would go to the Virginia State Legislature and ask for special appropriation. And their advisory board said, oh, ladies, you're out of your league. You don't understand how things work. There are more serious demands on the legislature than this. The economic times are tough. You know, just, just let it be. But the ladies said, nope, we're going. And they literally buttonholed every legislature, every legislator you know, using family connections, of course, uh, cousins and brothers-in-law, et cetera. And they succeeded in getting a $3,000 appropriation from the Virginia legislature, which they sent to Weaver. And then they said to him, so, so we're good, right? And Weaver said, not till I get that $3,800, no. The ladies were slightly offended that he wasn't willing to send them a quick claim, but he said, no, let's, let's wait and see what I actually get. And in fact, he did get some payments from the estate over the next couple of years, totaling about $1,250, but that left a balance of um, $2,105, which again, multiply that by 33 or so, and you've got a debt of about $66,000. This was not an insignificant amount of money for this man. Then again, there's a gap in the records until December 31st of 1901, at which point in time Weaver had reached the age of 60, quite a distinguished looking gentleman, still at Hahnemann Medical College. And I don't know whether it was the approach to the end of another year or whatever, but he decides 
to write again. So he writes to Kate Minor of the HMA. Well on to nine years have elapsed since I've received any communication from the association. Being previously disappointed and most desirous to know what progress is being made in the settlement of the Mari claim, will you please inform me what the prospects are for an early payment of the balance of the original debt? And she was not at all nice. She was very indignant in her replies. She said that it wasn't their responsibility to collect from the Mari estate. It was his responsibility. And beyond the monies that he might get from that source, quote, there is absolutely no money to get and no legal steps by which you could secure it if there were. And those words were written in such heavy pencil strokes that it's a wonder she didn't tear the page. She was not pleased with receiving this reminder from him that he had not been paid in full. So you might wonder, well, why didn't he sue them? Well, again, there's a document in this file folder that explains that. The association was founded while Virginia was under military rule. And so it was never officially incorporated. So it had no legal standing and he could not take them to court. But he's not willing to give up. So he contacts Ada Edgerton again and um, complains that he has not received a copper or a line from anyone associated with this matter and asked if there was anything else that she could do. Now, Edgerton is now over 70, but she must have been quite a lady because she got to work. She tried a new tack and she went to the UDC. Now, the UDC was a relatively new organization, having been founded in the 1880s and 1890s. And it was a, a growing and expanding organization, rivals to a certain extent from, with the LMAs. The LMAs looked to the past. They were concerned with you know, the honoring of the dead, uh, whereas the UDC was very much focused on the future and making sure that in particular future generations understood exactly why that war was fought and exactly why the South lost. So it was growing in popularity. The membership in general was younger. And so the LMAs were um, jealous and a little resentful of the UDC's power. But nonetheless, when um, Ada Edgerton went to the local UDC chapter, they said, well, sure, that, that's terrible that he hasn't been paid. We'll send out an appeal to our general membership to raise the money for him, which they did. And in May of 1902, uh, they actually, one of their members attended the HMA board meeting, at which point she was told to back off that it was not their debt. In fact, there was no debt and to mind their own business. So I don't know, honestly, if Weaver ever got any of the money that was raised by the UDC. Given the fact that, you know, it's come down through history that he was never paid in full, I suspect that he didn't get the money from the UDC. But he went on to become famous for other reasons. This thing on the right, this specimen on the right is, a, um, is basically the entire human nervous system, which Weaver dissected and removed from the body of a woman named Harriet Weaver, who had, I'm sorry, not Harriet, Harriet Weaver. Uh, I'm sorry, Harriet somebody, who had donated her body to medical science. It was quite revolutionary, quite remarkable. It was, you know, exhibited at the, at the World Fair, et cetera. And Weaver uh, became quite famous for doing that. Now, Ada Edgerton died in 1906, but Weaver lived on until 1936, a ripe old age of 95. He was buried in a simple uh, grave, simple cemetery outside of Philadelphia. His gravestone has the year of his birth and the year of his death and his name, and that's it. But about 60 years later, he started to get the attention he deserved. In 1997, this monument was erected in Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's where the original shipment of North Carolina dead were reburied. People who have been to Gettysburg will recognize on the left there that that's an image of the North Carolina Memorial there on West Confederate Avenue. And over on the right, it talks about the fact that um, the, um, the dead from Gettysburg were eventually uh, 
brought back to this cemetery with the aid of Dr. Rufus Weaver of Pennsylvania. Then in 2014, of course, this plaque was erected in Gettysburg. And in 2015, a very similar plaque was installed on Gettysburg Hill in Hollywood Cemetery, in which they acknowledge a debt of honor owed by all Southerners and recognize his generosity and humility. So he may not have gotten all the coppers that he was owed, but he ended up getting quite a lot of bronze dedicated to his memory. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Janet, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, something, you know, frankly, I knew nothing about. So it's, it's all new information to me, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Let me go to the chats and let's see what kind of questions that we, we have here. Jean Montgomery. Jean's question was, how did the diggers know whose body they were digging up? What kind of records were kept by each side? Okay, well, in the case of um, the Union remains, of course, it was a lot simpler because it was almost immediately after the battle. It, and in the markings that had been placed there by the soldiers' comrades were still in place. That's not to say that there weren't any unknown Union soldiers. If you go to the cemetery up at Gettysburg, you'll see that there are some there. But a lot of them were still identified. Uh, with regard uh, to records, well, basically, as I mentioned, Samuel Weaver as, well, back up, there were bodies everywhere. You know, it's like you you could walk down the street and throw a stone and you find a, a soldier's grave immediately after the battle. So it wasn't hard to find them, at least in the early years. And a couple of people kept records. Uh, Weaver, as I said. Samuel Weaver kept a record as he retrieved Union remains of where he saw Confederate burials. Um, there's a, a, a doctor, a, a Confederate, I'm not a Confederate, but a local doctor in Gettysburg who also kept a record of burials. Um, that's, that's Dr. O'Neill, Jonathan O'Neill. Thank you, John. Yep. Um, so there were several sources, but um, as I said, you know, all you had to do was knock on a door and say, hey, do you have anybody buried in your backyard? And the farmer's liable to say, yep, there's a guy back there under the chestnut tree. I was going to ask you the relationship between Weaver and O'Neill, if you know it, because because we are we are always talk about O'Neill as the guy who kept all the records of the Confederate dead there. He was he was a physician in Gettysburg, but he, he was a Confederate sympathizer, basically. <clears throat> yeah. I think he originally was from Virginia. Yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I talked to Tim Smith at, at the um, Adams County Historical Society last spring, if they still had O'Neill's list and they don't have the original lists, unfortunately. Um, I, but I know there are discrepancies. For example, you know, they're, the number that are buried at the Spangler Farm, O'Neill said there were four and Confederates and he named them by name including the, the state that they were from. But um, Ron Kirkwood, in writing the book on the farm, um, came up with 20. So I guess we'll never know exactly how many were there. Oh, and nobody's asked it. No, and I've given this presentation four times, and nobody's asked me yet. Um, but I can't prove one way or the other whether they were taken or not, because we've got detailed lists for four of the shipments, but not for two. And on the list for the four shipments that he sent, which includes the biggest ones, the, the first three that went in 1872, which was about 3,000 of the total, roughly 3,600 that he sent, um, the Spangler Farm is not mentioned. So he probably got them in 1873, and they were in one of the shipments for which we don't have records. I can't prove one way or another whether for sure whether they were retrieved. But... You know, as we talk about George Spangler, he was a very um, upright citizen, a good man. And I think if he knew that Weaver was in the area retrieving remains, he would at some point have made contact with him and said, you know, don't forget the guys in my orchard. The, the next comment is uh, uh, is a comment, and I, I, I think it, it 
sums it up very well uh, from my good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Severance, who writes, uh, exquisite analysis, so informative on a subject that rarely sees the light of scholastic inquiry and subsequent dissemination to the appropriate audience. Nicely done. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Robert Mulberger uh, asks, where is Rufus buried and ends it with excellent presentation? Um, I'd have to refer to my notes, which I don't have in front of me here. It's a cemetery outside of Philadelphia, but I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. Maybe I can get back to him later. Okay. Uh, Martha Jewett says, terrific information. Grateful to Dr. Rufus Weaver uh, and LMA. Amazing, John Anderson, another friend, says amazing original information and analysis. Did Dr. Weaver complete his mission in terms of all the bodies? I'm always amazed that with all the technical innovation of the Civil War soldier uh, name, name tags just seem to be common sense. Most of the dead are unknown. Well, he did not do any work after 1873. There was a reference that I've seen in two different places, including a history of Hollywood Cemetery that was written some years ago, that stated that he had retrieved all the remains except for approximately 40 buried in the Peach Orchard. So I went to John Heiser five years ago, um, or so, four or five years ago, before he retired. Um, for those who don't know, John Heiser was the chief librarian at Gettysburg National Military Park and said, what about this, John? I can't believe that there's still bodies in the Peach Orchard. And he said, there aren't. There are not. I've seen that reference too, but there are no remains in the Peach Orchard. So uh, that's all I can tell you. One of the things I've been interested in, and I think this is a major secondary theme of your work, is this this history of the 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 uh, LMA and the UDC and and uh, it, it, this history is like fascinating and I've always mm -hmm. had a lot a lot of respect for you know and I haven't really been thinking about differentiations of LMA and UDC and HMA and all this stuff but but I, but I always thought in my mind it was a phase one of of efforts by the ladies to do the right thing and get their family members and this was. You know, then, you know, and this is so important, uh, you know, to the families and ultimately to the healing of the United States. I'm not sure it was handled that well, but they did the best they could. And I just have a lot of respect for those ladies. And then you you sort of talked about the UDC and a sort of a secondary. So I just think that that is a major piece of your work. And I'm just so grateful to hear, hear your research on that. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And I, I, to comment further on, on what you just said, um, it was terribly important to these people to have closure. And, and uh, Drew Faust talks about that in her book, that, you know, you're dead, your, your loved ones were supposed to die at home and they were supposed to be surrounded by their loved ones and they were supposed to have that opportunity to say whatever needed to be said. Um, and so it was devastating to these women and fathers and brothers as well that, that didn't have that opportunity. Um, another little story, one day I'd given the presentation at the farm and afterwards this little girl came up to me and she couldn't have been more than about 11. And she said, can I ask you a question? Well, of course you can, sweetheart. She said, if I was one of those ladies and I didn't know where my loved one was buried, would I just go to a cemetery and kind of mourn generally? This was an 11 year old. And I said, that's exactly what you would do, sweetheart. You would go there with all the other ladies on what they called Memorial or Decoration Day, and you would lay flowers on the grave, and you'd hope that somebody somewhere was laying flowers on the grave of your loved one. Beth Wade asked, didn't soldiers, it said, well done, thank you, didn't soldiers pin their names on their blouses before entering battles? A lot of them did, but you can imagine that paper would not last very well in the ground for nine years. 
and these exhumations didn't really start until 1871, so eight years later. There wasn't much left beyond the bones and the buttons at that point. Got it. Uh, Janet Whaley of, uh, from California says, if Weaver was paid $3.25 uh, for the exhumation and packing of bodies, who paid for the shipping and trans transportation costs? There was a shipping, that's a very good question, and one that nobody else has ever asked. Um, there was a shipping firm in Baltimore that did it gratis, probably a friend of Ada Edgerton's. So they shipped them down to, by train, down to Baltimore, and then they went by uh, boat, basically, down the Potomac and then up the James to Richmond. Uh, a, a couple of people have weighed in and said that find a grave, uh, says that Rufus was buried in Mount Vernon Cemetery in Philadelphia. Thank you. Have bodies been found recently in recent years? Because we found one here in Franklin at a construction mm -hmm. site about 10 years ago. They, they, they found one in the railroad cut. When in Nine, 1996 was the yeah. last time a body yeah. was found in, at in, the rail, in the railroad, railroad cut. cut. Yeah, yeah. That, that man was interred in the um, National Cemetery. It was determined it was probably a 21-year-old or 22-year-old Confederate. Hmm. From Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you're right. Well, Janet, if you were uh, at uh, Fort Myer in person, you would be hearing a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, again, what we're uh, what I'm looking for this year is trying to find topics. You know, we we've done a lot of generals, we've done a lot of battles, but there is a lot more to the story that people like you have endeavored to uncover and have just done it in an excellent way. So, you know, thank you very much for sharing this with us. It, it was really an outstanding presentation.